Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Time and Tide, celebrating watchers, wearers, and their journeys since 2014. Limber up, because we are going to Basel World. Basel, 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 Basel. What is Basel World? This literally, physically, is Basel World, but what's inside? Let's go and have a look. Look, one of the best things about the first episode of the Home Delivery Watch Fair was the engagement. I asked for it, I got it, I'm asking you again. This time, if you could please list your five favorite watches released at Pretend Basel, Virtual Basel, in the comments. Vote or not vote on the Corona Beard situation. Should it go, should it stay, up to you. But please list your five favorite watches of the next hour. And we will, last time we, we offered a collector's pack, one of each of Time and Tide's magazine. I'm going to remind you of these two beautiful things. Today, in Basel, everything's bigger in Basel, and the prize is bigger too. We are offering a Time and Tide travel pack. Now this includes our famous burnt orange travel pouch, which always sells out each time we replenish it, and a Time and Tide strap changing tool, as well as two random straps to take with you on your adventures. There's gonna be a bond in there because I love bond NATOs, as well as a sailcloth strap. So we have a Watch Lovers Dream Travel Pack to give away. We're gonna give two away to people that list their top five. Don't be shy, I know you won't be. Seiko, three very important watches from the first decade of Seiko's dive watches. Now we have three models from three different years, 1965, 1968, and 1975. 1965 is SLA 037 and is good to 200 meters water resistance and is priced at 9,750 Australian dollars. The 1968 model with the crown at four is priced at $10,500 and is good for 300 meters water resistance. And that big old tuna is from 1975 is 6,950 and it's good for a kilometer of depth, which you would hope looking at that massive outer shroud of ceramic. Now the specs, Make sure you're sitting down or lying down. 52.4 millimeters in diameter and 17.2 millimeters high. So this watch says high from every angle. Up next is, without reservation, without any doubt in my mind, the most popular model we have talked about this year on Time and Tide, the Seiko SPB149. You guys cannot get enough. And that model is limited, if you call five and a half thousand watches limited. However, based on the riotous response, they will all sell out. There's good news though, because there are three other editions of the 62 MAS, which is, drum roll, Seiko's first ever dive watch. And they are SPB 147, 145, and 143, which are different colorways of that same 149 model. So they're non-limited, they're production models you're going to be able to pick up a watch that looks very similar, if not identical, by the colorway. A quick run through the specs. We have a 40.5 millimeter diameter, which is really lovely and tasteful. 13.2 millimeters thickness, which is very viable for a daily wear and 200 meters of water resistance, which is perfectly acceptable for a diver. The price of the SPB149 is 1,995 Australian dollars. Grand Seiko! Here's a fun fact. Grand Seiko released its first watch 60 years ago. How do we celebrate this? By releasing it again in three different variations. We have a watch here in brilliant hard titanium yellow, gold, or platinum, all with different dial colors. We have a silver dial, a lovely champagne dial, and a rich, deep blue. What else to say about these beauties? 72, 72 hours power reserve, running at 28,800 vibrations per hour, rocking the Grand Seiko Caliber 9S64. Accurate to plus five, minus three seconds a day 
absolutely stunning. Another 60th anniversary limited edition, this time with a hand engraved dial. The reference of this one is the SBGW263. It is a 39 millimeter case and 11.8 millimeters thin in a very heavy platinum. Note that both the minute track and the hour track, as well as the hands of this watch, have been carefully hand engraved with no guidance. As you can see, this really does look like a hand finished object, which it is. On the case back of this watch, we see the Grand Seiko gold medallion, which was on the early examples of Grand Seiko dress watches and production run, a mere 20 watches will be produced. The price of this watch is 97,000 US dollars. Lastly, we have the Grand Seiko Sports Collection Limited Edition, which has at first glance, let's call it out, a very vibrant blue ceramic bezel. This watch is powered by the well-known Grand Seiko 9F85 quartz movement, accurate to plus minus 10 seconds per year, not month. It is limited to 2,000 pieces and has a price of $3,900. An unbelievably geeky fact about this watch is that the quartz crystal inside has been put through a rigorous test where they applied three months of electrical current through the quartz crystal and those with the least rate variance after that period of time were selected to be used in these watches. Tag Heuer. Well, Tag has certainly picked up on the symbol in the sky. They have done their own Batman, an aqua racer with all the things you want from a sports watch. It is large and in charge at 43 millimeters. It is 300 meters water resistance and it has this all-star color scheme of a blue and a black bicolor bezel. It's also a GMT, which means that you have the option to trace two time zones when glancing at the dial. A tiny fact about the Tag Heuer Aqua Racer GMT is only one that you will see when the bat symbol is in the sky, which is two shades of loom. We have both a minty green and a blue loom, which light up in quite a display at night. The Tag Heuer Connected Generation 3. Well, finally, they admitted the Swiss, they can't do everything as well as they do mechanical watchmaking, and they've handed over the technological requirements of the watch to Google Wear OS in San Francisco. This really is the best marriage yet of a watch that feels like a Swiss watch on the wrist while performing very much like your other smartwatch. So that means all of the fitness functionality, all of the no notifications, all of the integrations with the apps you have on your phone in a package that includes a ceramic bezel that comes in either a steel case or a titanium case that has rubber straps or bracelets. Now this is a marriage of convenience of the very best kind. The Tag Heuer Connected Generation 3 is 45 millimeters in size, 13.5 millimeters thick, and price-wise, it comes in around about $26 to $2,800, depending on whether you're buying it on rubber or steel bracelet. The Tag Heuer Carrera 160 Years Silver Limited Edition. Now, little story. I was in Dubai, I was waiting for a taxi. I saw a woman with a very, very fine watch on her wrist that I'd never seen before. I tapped her on the shoulder. Not really, I wasn't that rude. I said, excuse me, ma'am. It turns out it was this watch. She was wearing this, she worked for the brand, and I was besotted, not with the woman, with the watch. This is a pitch perfect rendition of the first ever Carrera, the 2447S. Everything about this watch is perfect. The batten indices, the different finishings of the dial, the sympathetic vintage proportions, the 100 meters water resistance, which is a nice little modern touch to make it wearable every day. It is probably the best vintage reissue of the year so far. It came, it went. I got several text messages from Australians wanting to buy the 160 only models that are gonna be released. I told them all that they were dreaming. Next up in ISO time, we check in with Australian actor Chris Hemsworth. Like many celebrities, he's in isolation at the moment at his house in Byron Bay, and he's doing all the things we're doing. He's walking the dog, he's surfing, 
And in particular, he's homeschooling. Now this is something I can relate to. And it reminded me of an interview I did with Chris on a boat in Monaco, which yes, is the ultimate dinner party story. I've told it far too many times. Let's throw to that now and see if there's anything that, that is going to be of use for parents in this difficult time. My dream would be for them to talk about me as a parent one day and go, he was always there, he played with us, he was present, he, he, he listened, he paid attention, you know. Now watching this footage, it made me think how cool it would be to cross to Chris right now in isolation and ask him some questions. What's he doing? What's he reading? What's making him laugh? What's he listening to? And thanks to Tag Hoyer, we can do exactly that. Chris, mate, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I've been watching you lately on TV, actually. Congratulations on Extraction being oh, was the most streamed film on Netflix ever. That's awesome. Uh, what, what have you been watching? I'm really loving Ozark at the moment uh, with Jason Bateman and an incredible cast. The writing's fantastic. Performances are brilliant. Uh, if you haven't already checked it out, have a look. Ozark. That's dark. I love it, though. Um, Bateman. All the way. What about reading? I haven't been reading much. Um, I have three small children. <laughs> have you been reading at all? My must read list at the moment is this, The Art of Resilience by Ross Edgeley. Strategies for an unbreakable mind and body. Incredible individual, incredible book, incredible story. What about your morning routine? Like I find it in isolation, it's completely different, especially with kids. My morning routine, get up, have a shower uh, and have a train, I have a surf, it's a, it's a perfect scenario. Um, Actually, to be honest, usually it's my kids coming in at about 5.30, 6 a.m. and jumping on my head and screaming, we want breakfast, we want breakfast. Yeah, Chris, we're both uh, chefs as well as whatever else we do at home. Um, it's been a heavy time, let's be honest, but I've found that, you know, through this, the kids have made me laugh a lot. I don't know about you. Kids make me laugh just about every day. Uh, sometimes they make me cry. Um, I saw a pretty funny film the other day, Get Him to the Greek, which I've seen before with Russell Brand and Jonah Hill. An oldie but a goodie. Um, an oldie, he's probably, what, eight years old? It's, it's, it's hilarious. Yeah, that is a silver lining. Look, Chris, any last words to share with our people before we go? Stay safe, stay positive. Um, we're gonna get through this, we'll come out of it better, stronger, and, uh, and, and we're all in it together. All right, Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to Tag Hoyer for that wonderful footage. There's a thing at Basel World, which is when you have your first champagne. And that hour of the day gets earlier and earlier as the days go on. So I encourage you at this point, it's the drinks break. Go and fix yourself a drink. We might have elevated music, but I doubt it. I think we're gonna throw straight to ourselves on the couch because I am ready for a drink. And this drinks break is brought to you by Four Pillars, my favorite gin in the world. Welcome to the drinks break. Now the concept here is very simple. It's time to get a drink and it's time to have a break. Well, it's, it's time for me to have a break because I've been talking for about half an hour nonstop. I'm ready to, to listen, Luke. You must be parched. I, I am parched and I'm, I'm ready for a story, which is why I have Luke Benedictus here. Now Luke is not here just for his handsome looks and, and charming English, English accent. He's here because Luke joined me on many Basels. We weren't in the same team at that point. You were... That was in my former life. I used to be at Men's Health magazine. Yes, so the, the old enemy. But we've been to, we, yeah. we did a count back and it's, what? I think it was seven. I've been to seven. Seven. And, yeah. Absolute road warrior. We've got Basel stories to tell because often you'll hear from us about what happens during the day. But really a lot of the action happens at night and there seems to be some sort of fight club Basel code where it never really gets out what happened. We're just about to break that code. Before we do though, it is a drinks break and we don't have a drink. And I am excited to announce that today we have four pillars in the office making us a cocktail. This is like dream come true stuff. Four pillars is not only my favorite gin, it's my favorite spirit, full stop. So we have Missy in the office who is going to um, slake a very parched throat. Missy, what do you have for me? Hi, I'm Missy from Four Pillars and today we are going to be making um, a summer cocktail with our Changing Seasons gin. So this is a really nice, easy cocktail. It's really refreshing, really vibrant. Again, perfect for summer, hence the name. So we're gonna start off with a big whack of our Changing Seasons gin, 45 mils, or if it's Friday, feel free to go 60. Nice, big one there. 
Now I don't find this gin needs too much added to it to showcase how beautiful it actually is. So today I'm just going to top it up with a little bit of um, fresh Japanese yuzu from Strangelove. I usually like to go three parts mixer, one part gin. Or again, if it's Friday, you can make it a little bit bigger. Top that up with some ice. And now just to bring out those really vibrant, fresh green flavors, I'm just gonna garnish that with just a little piece of kefir lime. And there you have a really nice changing seasons summer cocktail. I can never resist this trick. It's the I dream of genie. Make a drink appear. I can do this. Missy, make a drink appear. Three, two, one. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> So this time around, we're going to make, I guess, a Japanese version of a forgotten classic called Nalaska. So first we're gonna start off with, again, another big whack of our Changing Seasons gin. So 40 mils of that one. Straight in the glass. Next, I guess this is what you'd use as, or compare as the, uh, the vermouth substitute. But we're just gonna use 20 mils of a Japanese sake. And then finally, we're just gonna finish that off with just a dash of yellow chartreuse. Keep in mind how strong chartreuse is, so you only want a dash. Top that up with some ice. And then you wanna garnish that with a little piece of lemon. And to bring out those savory notes, we're also gonna add an olive in there too. And then you have the autumn cocktail. Can I have a drink too? <laughs> so we have uh, two wonderful Four Pillars mm -hmm. cocktails. I'm already refreshed. Okay, let's get down to business, Luke. We have a story to tell about Basel and why are we telling it together? Well, we're telling the story together because we've become quite good mates over the years, but we, Andrew, we actually met at Basel all those years ago, I think in That's 2012. Yeah. yeah. So again, we're veterans of Basel, we've been to many, and what you've seen on Time and Tide over all these years is a lot of the, the professional side, you know, what happens during the day, we talk about what happens when we go into the booths and inspect the watches, but we haven't ever talked about what happens at night. So basically so, you're saying I'm the counterpoint to the professionalism. <laughs> exactly. And now that you've seen the professional side, let's talk about the nighttime. Well, look, Luke and I have been to um, many Basel parties together and when we mentioned this segment, you started sending me pictures from your phone dating right back to 2012. And again, I don't know whether there's going to be some Illuminati takedown of me and, and the business for sharing these because they just don't ever get out. But these pictures are so good. But firstly, how do you describe Basel to other people? Because for me, it's it's always a struggle to, to get quite the, the, the size and scale and weirdness of it. I think the first time I went um, in 2011, I was totally blown away by it. Um, I think the thing, I feel quite nostalgic about Basel now that I, I'm not, now that it's all, all done and dusted, but I think the thing is, is that the first time I found it, I found it absolutely overwhelming. Mm. You know, as, as journalists from Australia, we do this long flight to get over there. And I think the thing you always forget is that then you're gonna have to hit the ground running. You know, I used to go there for four days. I used to have, you know, 30 meetings over those four days, but then every night, they would be, you know, drinks, there would be dinners, there would be parties. And there's the Breitling party. Now we have to talk about this. Again, not something that's ever written about on Time and Tide, but a big part of the week was this sort of peak event, which was a party that sort of summed up what is really, like I said in the intro, this is a lost world now. Basel, in its grandeur at that scale, Basel world, seems to be a thing of the past. And, and almost the peak Basel experience, certainly the peak Basel experience, Experience, was this Breitling party. What was this party, Luke, and what made it so such an Alice in Wonderland type of experience? Well, I mean, I think quite simply, they're the most decadent 
parties I've ever been to by such a long way. Ever. So there were these top secret parties <laughs> where every night this bus would pick you up and they would take you to you'd, a secret You'd be location. given a token. You had to, you, had, you were given a token yeah. that you had to provide to get on the bus. And these tokens were like really quite, I mean, elaborate. And if you didn't have it, you simply didn't get on the bus. So if you lost it, the party was over. And then Even before it begun. That's right. And then you'd be taken on this bus to this secret location. Uh, and then it was like a sort of a, a decadent wonderland. I think I remember one, it started off and it was like a treasure island theme with kind of sort of sexy mermaids <laughs> and sort of Tahitian sort of uh, girls in gla gra grass skirts. And then there would be some showpiece in the middle. In this case, it was a, uh, a mock execution where this pirate queen was rescued by um, a bunch of marauding pirates. And yeah. then we were all led into a a sort of an S and M dungeon for a for a, basically a rave. Yeah, and, and there was no congruency between <laughs> these scenes. My first one was the year later, and it was a loosely a Mad Max theme. It was kind of a Beyond Thunderdome theme. It started with we were all given it was freezing cold, and we were all given foil blankets, and we went and stood outside in a car park. And then they had motorbike riders flying everywhere with flames and then Tina Turner, I might have, might have actually been Tina Turner, wouldn't have surprised me. That was the first scene. And then there was a um, sexy unicorn theme. And this is all, we've got like the pictures. It, hopefully we're spinning these pictures, right? Yeah, because I mean, that's the thing. It is the, while our memories are sort of quite fragmentary for, <laughs> for obvious reasons, it was all quite loosely tied together. So yeah, yeah. we've got pictures of- There was a narrative. And then sort, sort of. But sort of, you know, then despite it being Mad Max and suddenly some sort of sexy cops would come and sort of handcuff you to a to railing. No, that was and, just, look, we have we have footage of Luke. I, I think I actually got the sexy cop unicorn pirate to, to get you up on the wall. This all sounds absurd, but while we're talking, hopefully the, the, the corroborating evidence is there. But. Breitling used to do these parties every night for five for five nights. Yeah. And the, the poor Breitling guy, he used to have to go to it every single night. And there was a lot of, I mean, you didn't just go and have, you could, kind of couldn't be on the waters for these events. But for me, I think that probably the coolest thing about these, these parties is that they would spend, an, they must have spent a horrific amount of money on these parties every night. There wasn't a single bit of branding, was there? None. And there was, strangely enough, the story just never got out until now. So. If this is the last thing I ever do, I would like to say thank you for the support over the years. Um, it was worth it to blow the lid off the Breitling party, which by the way, we must say, Breitling did actually put an end to this themselves. This, this isn't something that's now going to end as a result of the coronavirus, as a result of the changing fare situation. This had already sort of had its day. So mm. we were there for, for a loss, and it feels genuinely like a lost world. I think when George Kearns came along, didn't he? He kind of he said he wanted to make Brightling a little bit less less virile, was his words. And uh, <laughs> because I think back then Brightling was seen as this real alpha alpha male brand, mm. and look, probably a lot of the stuff that did happen was I know a bit that over the top. From our comments, that there are many who <laughs> who missed the virility. But look, for better or worse, um, we were there for many many of them, and uh, I thank you for bringing that part of Basel. To us all. And thanks again yeah. to Four Pillars for this drink. The last thing I want to do is I want to call another sparring partner of ours spontaneously on my telephone to talk about how this is unscripted and this is a very bad idea. But I think it's worth talking about how parties in the watch industry go together pretty comfortably. Let's just, um, let's do this. Do you remember, do you know what I'm doing right now? Who are you calling now? I'm getting a bit worried now. <laughs> Hey, look hey. who's here. Oh, Michael Klim. Hello. <laughs> hey. Australian Olympic legend, Michael Klim. We are talking about the, the parties that we've had with watches as an excuse. Do you happen to remember any of those? With watches as an excuse. Um, well, it's one, certainly one of them where we're all together in one room at the Rio Olympics bragging about the best Omega that each all, all of us had on our wrist, but I think you, you trumped us, I think, uh, Andrew. So, yeah, I remember that time very fondly. Yeah, so I, I always pull out Omega Flex. I've got that vintage Omega Flex. Now, Clemmy, we're, we're talking about, you know, just how um, much a part of 
parties and events have been for, for us in the watch industry. There was one particular event in Rio where <laughs> things got pretty weird. What happened there? Well, I mean, Rio is all, you know, obviously besides the Rio Olympics, uh, it's famous for the carnival, of course, right? So, <laughs> um, and seeing that we're in the true junket, uh, they wanted to give us that experience of a, of a real Rio experience. So. Um, we got dropped off in the ghetto somewhere and um, <laughs> got, got, uh, got dressed up in the carnival gear and um, very actually non-reluctantly really wearing dresses and wigs and, and makeup. So um, it just... Uh, <laughs> and you never let me forget this, Klimi. You keep every... You must have like a, a reminder to send me an embarrassing photo at least once a month. <laughs> I took a lot of photos of you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, it's been really good. And look, I, Luke, it turns out Luke and I met at a party in Basel in 2012. So the friendships, you know, these things only cement great friendships. Look, Clemmy, we are doing a quick wrist check. Have you got a watch on today? I actually don't. <laughs> 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 and lastly, because you know we love watches here, what's on your mind? What's your next watch? My next watch, <laughs> actually, uh, I don't know. To be honest, I've, I've, I've never had a Breitling before, and I'd, I'd love one <laughs> one day. But also, <laughs> uh, maybe a, look, I'm, I'm doing a, an expedition around the island of Indonesia soon, and something that can handle the pressure underwater when you go really deep. We're gonna do some free diving and um, so maybe if I survive that trip, I'll, I'll give myself something special. But so yeah, I'll leave you, let you guys yeah. to decide what is a good free diving watch. What's the, uh, the creme de la creme of free diving watches? What do you reckon? Well, look, that's a good one to put to our viewers. You know, that we're gonna, they're never short of opinions and ideas in the comments, so <laughs> I expect this will just be another reason to write to us. Hey, Clemmy, thanks so much for joining us. You know, we were thanks, we were a, a three amigos in Rio, and uh, it fits in really nicely to uh, to turns out how Luke and I met. It's quite romantic. Yeah, yeah. and look, you uh, you got mistaken three and thought of a bunch of times. So, uh, <laughs> that was a really that, that was that was a fun trip. We ran with that. We ran half the relay was there. So, exactly. So it was fantastic. I'm glad we got to chat and see you guys. Smiling faces. Indeed, mate. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Clemmy. See you, Clemmy. Thanks, Clemmy. Yeah, Cheers. See you guys. <laughs> okay, well, that brings to a close our drinks break. Um, well, it does for me. You can keep drinking. And I give you full permission to get a really stiff drink and watch the end of the show. Um, but before we go, Luke, I'd like to finish where we we're meant to start, which is what are you wearing? What is that gorgeous vintage watch uh, there? Today I'm wearing it's a uh, it's a Vacheron Constantine uh, Patrimony from 1960. Mm. And if you want to know the story of Luke's watch, it's a really really good story. Um, there's a there'll be something <laughs> there'll be a super somewhere, but uh, this is a great story. Check out Time and Tide. Thanks for joining us on the drinks break. Thanks to uh, Four Pillars for their beautiful changing seasons gin in a summer cocktail and an autumn cocktail. Back to the show. See you at the desk. In late breaking news, we bring you exclusive footage of what COVID-19 is currently doing to the watch industry. Thank you, you listener, Dan, for the demonstration. Guys, thank you so much for joining us on a very long and very extensive pretend fake Basel World 2020. We have had, I don't know, how many watches was that? 30 or 40, at least. And what you couldn't see while I was sitting here expertly reeling off a lot of detail was that Nick was reading a lot of it to me. <laughs> and at this point, I must introduce you to the person to my right, the man to my right, this is Nicholas Kenyon the deputy editor of Time of Tide. Hello. Now, usually when I say that, Chris Farley runs down or Jack Black ran down this morning. This is the real Nick Kenyon. I must assure you, those other two were just pretending to be. Fake imitations. Indeed. So now we present to you the top 10 watches of Basel World 2020, should it have happened, and only including brands that would have presented at Basel in the last couple of years or so. So Nick, explain to me the format. It's a five on five. Think of basketball. We're going to take it in turns and see what we go through. I'm off. Number one, this watch right here. 
B camera. <laughs> this watch right here, the Longines Hydro Conquest Ceramic in Green. Now this watch has everything you'd expect from a higher price point watch at a very reasonable price of 2,175 Australian dollars. It has a ceramic bezel, it has 300 meters water resistance, it has a modified 2892 Eta movement, it has an integrated rubber strap. It really is a perfectly wearable, fantastic sports watch that I'm frankly wearing in non-sports scenarios as well. Yeah, good choice. For my first one, it's gonna be a watch that I spent a freezing couple of hours with in the Port Phillip Bay here in Melbourne. The Doxa Carbon uh, Sub 300 Aqualung. It's a very compelling watch for what you're getting for the money. It's a full carbon case and dial. Comes on an integrated rubber strap, very similar to that one over there, mm -hmm. uh, with a slightly different clasp. There's a titanium shell that protects the movement, which is also cost certified, unusual for Doxa. And it's just a, a fantastic watch. It's only about 87 grams, so a proper modern sports watch from a brand that has historically relied on uh, vintage reissues. I think it's a great step forward. And that's exactly the point with this Doxa, is that sometimes when you've had a lot of vintage reissues that are, you know, hailed for their veracity to the original. You wonder where can this brand go? They're kind of boxed into a historical corner. Docs are just smashed out of that with a very breakthrough colorway, like the yellow and the black. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's a very modern and cool. But it's still very Doxa because of the case shape, which is yeah. kind of consistent with the uh, with the 60s and 70s. So, Cushion uh, baby. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool, I'm up again. What have you got? I'm gonna go a watch that excited me no end in January. It is the Hublot Integral, Big Bang Integral in King Gold. And I'm specifically choosing the King Gold because this, because of the nature of gold, it has a lot more sparkle and shine. So the chamfered edges and of, the, of each link have contrasting finishes. However, on the other versions, there was a lot less differentiation between the finishings. And also the weight of it is extremely luxe. You put this watch on, it's 42 mil, so for a Hublot it's not massive. And for a non-Hublot wearer until now, it's a lot less challenging because big watches aren't everyone's taste. And certainly for me, I don't like to get above 42 unless it's my big pilot. Um, but it's really a, a, a power watch that's expressed in a really tasteful way. And again, the design of this bracelet, Nick, these guys, four years on a bracelet. It's crazy how much development went into this, this one component that has, for me, kind of presented the best Big Bang I've ever seen. Fantastic. Yep. Alrighty, for my second choice, it's the Hamilton PSR. Um, it's just a really fun watch. It's a period of watchmaking that isn't really referenced that much anymore, uh, the kind of digital era or early digital era of 1970s. Uh, it's still got the kind of push button to show the time. I just really like it. Well, it's also, it's evoking, well, it's re-evoking a great movie. You know, Bond yep. seems to have been very much uh, ring-fenced by a couple of brands as being their boy, yep. but he he had quite a diverse range of watches. If you if you look at the full collection, That's this is it. one of them. Yeah, he uh, yeah he wasn't just restricted to uh, to mechanical watches. He was happy to to play in the the futuristic technology of the time. Um, and yeah, Live and Let Die was a, a film made all the better for it. Yeah. It's a couple of years before I was born, which you know, increasingly I, I can't say that very often these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ripper, and again, it's a. When, when we saw Better Call Saul wearing a similar watch, it just has massive Colts mood. It's yep. a really big mood. I, yep. I'm into it. Yep. What have you got next, Andrew? I am moving to, I think there's only one other time in Time and Tide's six year history that I have chosen a women's watch in my top 10. Not because I don't like women's watches, just because they don't really speak to me in the same way as a watch designed for my gender. Understandable. The Midnight Defy. I'm just gonna keep talking about it because I think that this watch is so clever and so simple. Like it's, there's, there's, the best poetry is for me, it's not elaborate with endless heroic couplets. It's something that can be very, very simply said. And this is a watch that reflects the night sky, the graduation of the night sky from light to dark in, uh, in that vertical 
graduation in the same way that the James Cameron Deep Sea Sea Dweller did, um, but it has a spray of, of, of stars yep. in the upper realm. And across a, a few different colorways, we get a sense of different skies. There's a, a nice sort of pitch blue midnight sky. There's a gray early dawn or, or dusk with a pink musky t tint. Yeah. It's just beautiful. And I, fe I just felt myself really moved by the, the simple creativity of that collection. And like I've said many times, I think that this has um, massive potential to migrate into a man's watch, which hasn't has happened many times in watchmaking, watches being designed for women that end up with men. I yeah. want it to happen. I've said that lots of times. Yeah, I hope it does. Yeah. Next up for me, I have got a brand that's very close to my heart, Grand Seiko. This is the 60th anniversary since the first Grand Seikos were made. And these are recreations of those watches. So there's three different variations of them. One with a blue dial, I think that's in titanium. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a yellow gold one with a sort of eggshell dial and also- Let's call it champagne. Champagne, yeah. champagne dial, kind of tinge to it. And then there's also a platinum one with a, with a whiter dial. I've got to say the yellow gold for me, there's just something very classy about it. It's mm. clean, it's simple, there's no fuss, but it's just really, really beautifully put together. It is, and, and Grand Seiko's 60th anniversary models are exemplifying the fact that simplicity never goes out of style. Number four from me is one that instantaneous, knew it was in my top 10 for the year, and it was January. Again, it was one of those bold comments. But the Octo Finissimo Satinato in steel with a black dial, Look, it could easily be the blue dial, which yep. has since been released, but I haven't seen it. So I can't I can't include it if I haven't seen it. The black one alone was was enough though. The Satinato refers to the different finishings that are applied to all these. To me, it feels like thousands of facets on this watch. Yeah. It's an angular watch. It's angular, it's there's, there's an edge to every edge, there's an edge to that edge, it, and then as you apply different finishings to all of these, it really, it lifts what a masterpiece the Finissimo is straight off that, that object, and you just think, wow, this is a lot of work. And one small detail, when you look at this Finissimo Satinato, the bezel is a different finishing to the, um, the shape that it's within, and yet it's only a millimeter or two above that shape. And you think, okay, well that's because they've applied this bezel it's, it's extra to the case. It's not, it's all the same piece of metal. It just takes these unbelievable craftsmen and you know, it takes unbelievable engineering to be able to bring different lusters to all of these levels of the watch. So look, for that reason and the fact that it feels bloody nice, it's a little bit heavier than the titanium. Like if you had an issue with a watch that was super light, um, it's there and it's now 100 meters water resistant. So where maybe the titanium was a bit of a showpiece that you'd you know, put on the bedside table when you went for a swim, you can definitely jump in now with the, uh, the Satinato and steel. I love it. It's a, it's a serious sports watch. Um, they've been playing around the edges for a little while and they've, they've, they've taken the plunge. It's well, very, very good. They have and they, look, they've been able to do sports watches, but, but none that have, none in a particular style that is unique to the house. Yep. And yet the Finissimo instantly, as soon as it was released was, okay, well, I guess that's Bulgari's expression of masculinity and an expression of modern watchmaking. Now it's an expression of those things that is very viable to, to not leave the wrist ever. Like this is a watch you can wear everywhere. I really feel like I talk a lot about it. <laughs> it's awesome. That, that and the Midnight Defy. Next up for me, we've got the Casio NASA Limited Edition. Again, another little fun one. You've got some quirky retro watches in there. I just like them. Yeah, I'm it's, down with that. It's it's just a little bit different. It feels like you want fun in your life. Yeah, uh, I don't think watchmaking always has to be taken too seriously. Clearly not. Um, I think that there's, yeah, there's plenty of opportunity for people to really enjoy the hobby at any price point. And I think this Casio NASA is a fantastic example of it. It's not very expensive, only a few hundred Australian dollars. It has the uh, iconic uh, NASA worm logo, um, no other real branding to it. It's otherwise a fairly pristine white. And I just think it's, yeah, not something we've really seen from G-Shop before. And the best thing about this watch is yes. the way that you can Press the button, illuminate the dial, and you get a sort of superimposed image of the moon, which is quite cool. Nice touch. Nice touch. <laughs> Lastly for me, 
it's pretty serious actually, and it's pretty new. I've been crushing on the Glacier Originals 60 series Glacier, Glacial Blue? Glacier, Glacier Blue? Glacier Blue, yep. One of those two, since I saw the artist impressions and since I saw the renders. But then when I saw it photographed, my infatuation went to another level. And I've since discovered only today, in the notes that was kindly provided by Nicholas Kenyon, thank you Nick, the artistry in this dial, because it is two intersecting fine arts. We have degradé finishing and we have sunray finishing occurring on the same dial, and it is magnificent. So the glacial blue is again this very washed out, pale blue yep. um, with that that is degradé, meaning that it, it intensifies towards the outer, I think, in this one. It's darker and then gets brighter yes, as you go exactly. in. exactly. Um, so it is very much like the Iris of an Eye. I can't get enough of this watch. I'm gonna go the time-only model, yep. um, because the chronograph, I just don't think you really need anything to... To, to, to make it more complicated. Doesn't need anything else. Yep. Um, I absolutely adore it, and I think that um, it is a, a new expression of what has been a very successful little twist for Glass Shoot Original, which yeah. was the 60s series. First in those really vibrant, lurid orange and green, and now we have this very pale. pale oh, it's just, it's like looking, it's quite freaky in a, in a good mm. way. It's like looking into an eye. It, um, yeah, it's not often when you look at watches as much as we do that you see something totally new. It but, makes um, you kind of like, you know, stumbling over my words back there. That wasn't me being unprofessional. That was me being, <laughs> I, I'm still Deeply struggling. I'm, I'm struggling to describe <laughs> the uh, the artistry at work here because this is, and again, a couple of other details. It has a um, box sapphire crystal on the dial side. It has a box sapphire crystal on the case yep. back side. So you can see the movement uh, through the case back as well. Nick, what a game of basketball. <clears throat> Lucky last for me. Yep, oh, okay. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> You can take the final line on us. What do you got? Uh, <laughs> another um, fun one? Uh, it is another pretty fun one, I think. It's the SBB 149 from Seiko. That's not fun, that's just great. They've been doing a really good job recently. Um, it's 55th anniversary of their first ever dive watch, of which this is an expression. They have released a couple of watches with similar sorts of case styles this year, but I think the 149 specifically in terms of the dial color um, is most consistent with the original. It's a great size, 40 and a half millimeters, I think 13.2 maybe thick. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. And it's usually when someone says, oh, I've got a limited edition of 5,000 watches, we'd snigger a little bit. We're not really sniggering because this is almost certainly going to sell out. I mean, the, the feedback, the traffic the the riot that we've yeah. experienced when we released first the pictures and then the video it's crazy there's something yeah. about this watch you've yeah. gone for an absolute crowd pleaser to finish so that's fine you know you take the take the obvious most popular one that's cool you have that it, it's a great price as well it's only 1995 Australian dollars yep um, I think at that price point five and a half thousand of them shouldn't be too hard to sell yeah all right Nick I uh, need to lie down. That was, again, like I said, after the, the first Watches and Wonders virtual fair, I'm just as tired as having done it. How, how do you feel? Uh, I've not been to Watches and Wonders or Basel World. Mm -hmm. I've been to a Dubai Watch Week, but it wasn't nearly as tiring as the, uh, the big fair sound, but I'm pretty tired as well. No, well, it's awesome. And look, again, we're doing this to thank and support an industry that has supported us over six years. Um, look, we couldn't get there as an industry to either fair this year for, for reasons that are obvious. Um, at the very least, we wanted to bring together a lot of the components, a lot of the people that make these fairs great. You know, we've had a fellow media um, constituent here tonight, Frank. We've had uh, Luke, a friend of ours, talking about what happened after hours. Um, all, all in all, it just wrapped up into a way for us to to bring to you what we've missed out on, but maybe that you can now have a better understanding of. So we hope you've enjoyed it. Again, I asked you last time if you liked the long format. If you're still watching now, I think it's a yes. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm truly grateful for the positive feedback for what we're trying to do with this longer format. We will endeavor 
to bring it to you again, but only if you want it and only if you say that that uh, this fits into your, I'm sure, very, very packed Netflix schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. From us at Time and Tide in Melbourne, Australia in early May 2020, take care, stay safe, and hey, tell us your top five to go in the running for that cool Time and Tide travel pack. Have a great night, have a great morning. See you soon. Thank you.